so a couple of quick anecdotes. You know, in a way, I go back with this organization longer than anyone realizes. When I was in medical school in 1976 as a uh, third year medical student, my first neurosurgical advisor was actually Tom Millerot. And the first paper of any sort I wrote was under his guidance. And Tom, as you know, is remembered very fondly by many people here. Um, the other thing that's very interesting today is that this conference reminds me very much of a meeting I went to in Rio de Janeiro a number of years ago. Um, at that meeting, uh, it was the meeting of the Rio de Janeiro Neurosurgical Society. We were meeting in a hotel on the Copacabana, very elegant. And there was another international group meeting simultaneously. That was the International uh, Gathering of Hell's Angels. So with the UFC next door, I think I'm sort of, there's a pattern to where I'm invited. Um, so. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to take the privilege of uh, age and perhaps experience to discuss some philosophic concepts. Um, and I'm going to bring this from the concept of perhaps a more community-based evaluation of where Chiari and Syringomyelia exist. And primum non necessary for the physicians in, in the room know, know that this is our most sacred uh, command, first do no harm. Um, and whatever we do, I think that always has to be kept in mind. So when we think of first doing no harm, we have to know to intervene only when it is appropriate, which means that our diagnostic acumen and our judgment long before we initiate any treatment is critical. And then when we do initiate a treatment, we have to think of the least risk for the, of the treatment, and also what is the long-term outcome. And the long-term outcome is particularly critical when we deal with children. As an adult, if I have a condition and any one of you here tells me that you will bring me relief or satisfy my needs for three months, six months, a year, I'm going to be incredibly grateful. But for children, when we're looking forward to 70, 80, 90 years of life, to bring them a relief or a transient benefit has far less impact. So again, in way of background, I think it's important to remember that prior to the early 80s, Chiari was almost never diagnosed in the pediatric population. And the only time it was diagnosed was pretty much in teenagers who had the misdiagnosis of uh, demyelinating disease, multiple sclerosis. Since the advent of the MRI, we have learned that the Chiari is present in perhaps 1% of the general population. When Dr. Menezes gave his talk earlier, he described the Chiari anomaly. And it led me to think, you know, we refer to this as a malformation. What's the difference between a malformation and an anomaly? So I actually, over lunch, Googled the difference. It turns out that anomaly is a deviation from what we expect. It's not the average, it's not the norm. Whereas a malformation is generally considered something abnormal. So I think when we consider the term Chiari, I think Dr. Menezes actually does us a great favor. It is an anomaly, it's a deviation from the norm, but not in all cases is this something that requires treatment. Interestingly, a more recent study actually looked at over 1,000 patients who had CT and MRI scans after motor vehicle accidents, and up to 25% of them had their cerebellar tonsils extending below the frame and magnum. The other condition that we deal with in pediatrics that in inevitably overlaps with the diagnosis of a Chiari is headache. Headache is common throughout the pediatric population. In fact, in any given year, about 17%, about one in six children, will complain to their pediatrician of severe and unremitting headaches. In addition, when you look at specific type of headaches and what percentage of the population at some point experiences headache, migraines increase exponentially throughout childhood. By puberty, about one in 10 children will have experienced a migraine. And by age 15, over a quarter of all children will report having one or more migraines. So therefore, by simple calculation, 
not being a mathematician, but just a simple surgeon, we can assume that if you took all patients who have radiographic Chiari malformations, um, that at least 1% of all patients who have Chiari, I'm sorry, 1% of all patients who have migraines should have a Chiari, and at least 17 to 28% of all patients um, with Chiari should have migraines. So we have to remember what's normal before we go to what's abnormal. In general, I would think that there are fairly common surgical indications for the treatment. And I'm not going to argue about some of the more esoteric things that are seen in adulthood, but I'd like to concentrate on the pediatric population. Syringomyelia tends to be a relatively easy one. If you have a significant cyst in the spinal cord, almost all neurosurgeons agree with it. Headache becomes somewhat more contentious. We can all agree that severe suboccipital and upper cervical pain that comes on suddenly, has a brief onset, and is associated with coughing, sneezing, and other Valsalva maneuvers is more likely than not Chiari-related and has an excellent response to surgical treatment. However, as you veer further and further away from these classic Valsalva cough-related headaches, tussiv headaches, the word tussiv means cough in Latin, just like Robitussin, you have less and less likelihood that the headache will respond to surgery. The other part is having a headache in and of itself is never an indication for surgery. The headache has to affect your quality of life or your activities of daily living. Many people, if you give them the option between living with their headache, even though you know you can relieve it with surgery, or having an operation, many will choose to live with the headache as long as the quality of life is not adversely affected. The other two indications I think are fairly straightforward but incredibly rare in the pediatric population is significant cerebellar dysfunction and significant brainstem dysfunction. Dr. Menezes, in his incredible experience, showed us a number of patients with brainstem dysfunction in the presence of syringomyelia and syringobulbia, but you can have primary brainstem dysfunction. In my own experience, which we're not going to talk about my adult experience today, I've seen this almost exclusively in adults above the age of 40, and again, it's a handful of times over three decades. So syringomyelia and headache are going to be the two primary indications in the pediatric population. I do want to caution that not every fluid collection is syringomyelia. For those of you who are not physicians, I'll re briefly review how we all develop as embryos. Our nervous system starts as a flat ribbon. That ribbon then folds into a cylinder. That cylinder fills with nerve fibers and ultimately goes on to form our brains and spinal cords. Every one of us in this room, if we were to take our spinal cord and section down the middle of it and look under a microscope, we would see a small residual canal the remnant of when our spinal, uh, I'm sorry, our nervous system was simply a hollow tube. In some patients, remnants of this hollow tube, what we call the central canal, remain. And you can see, for example, in this one, there's a very thin canal, very thin fluid collection in the spinal cord, typically down at the very bottom of the spinal cord in the conus, and typically at the junction between the neck and the back, the cervical thoracic region. This is a central canal, and it almost never is seen with a Chiari malformation, or most of them do not have associated Chiaris. In contrast, even though this is a relatively thin syrinx, it is a very definitive syrinx with a definitive Chiari malformation. The other thing is that not every craniovertebral anomaly requires fusion or decompression. This happened to be a young man I saw when he was 15, uh, had typical holocord syringomyelia, massively dilated syrinx. Uh, he had an obvious anterior brainstem anomaly, anterior craniovertebral anomaly, with the odontoid, the tip of the spine pressing into the brainstem, but he had no symptoms from that. We did a straightforward Chiari decompression, and this is his 20-year follow-up where he remains asymptomatic from the craniovertebral anomaly, has had near complete collapse of his syrinx, 
and continues to work now for over 15 years as a financial consultant. We'll assume being a financial consultant is not a result of a Chiari malformation. So when you think of a Chiari, one of the questions I always wonder is do you hear hoofbeats? What, what do you think of when you hear hoofbeats? Are you thinking of a horse or a zebra? Or occasionally we'll have a combination of the two. So these are six patients that I saw in my office over the last four weeks. And the question is, which of these has a Chiari that is potentially amenable to surgical therapy? So, this one was a very straightforward migraine. Headaches on half the head, throbbing headaches, preceded by a sense of nausea, relieved by um, a nap, and ultimately placed on anti-migraine medication with complete relief. Definite Chiari malformation, definitely not symptomatic, definitely not a surgical candidate. This patient had migraines, and although she was referred as a Chiari, I don't think there is a Chiari. There's your frame and magnum, and the tonsils are above it. So particularly for a headache disorder, I would be very leery that tonsils above the frame and magnum are responsible for the headache. Another one with migraines. Well, this one, in fact, did have a syrinx. But I would be hard-pressed to see much difference between the lower left and the upper right. This patient was the interesting one. This is the mixed headache. Definite migraines, but also when she coughed or sneezed, she complained of severe headache. When you asked her to weigh out which of these headache varieties were causing her the most problem, she said, let's get rid of the migraines first, and then we'll see what we do about the others. And so far, with relief of migraines, she has not been interested in any surgical intervention. And then this one is a syrinx, although not the most expanded one. This was a child who had no symptoms, was in an accident while playing soccer, had an MRI scan, saw the Chiari, and I had recommended that she have an MRI of her neck to see whether or not a syrinx is present. So this we would consider an incidental syrinx. So what surgical interventions are commonly performed? Bony decompression, <coughs> bony decompression with duraplasty, with various intradural and intraarachnoidal um, procedures, occasionally posterior fossa fusion, and occasionally anterior decompression with posterior fossa fusion. But at least in the pediatric population, the first time around, this will be the overall, the vast, vast majority of the procedures that will be performed nationwide. So a lot of the discussion in the pediatric world is do you open the door or do you not? And there are pros and cons on both sides of the equation. The pros in the literature say that you have increased symptom relief, more rapid relief, and more rapid resolution of syringomyelia, and you may have less recurrence. The cons, the people who are the non-openers will say, but you subject the patient to CSF leakage, to meningitis, more likely an aseptic or chemical reaction to the surgery. You can have more bleeding, you can have wound healing problems, hydrocephalus, and longer hospital stay. So the questions I thought I would try to address in the next few minutes is, when, what is the incidence of other syndromes in those patients who ultimately undergo surgery for Chiari malformation? What percentage of all patients who are referred to neurosurgeons truly have symptomatic Chiaris? Oops, I'm sorry. Um, what's the overall rate of improvement following intervention with both headaches and syrinx? What's the time course? Is it rapid? Is it slow? Does it give us any indication when we have to think about further therapies? What is the acute morbidity or complication rate? Infections, wound problems, chemical meningitis, neurologic problems. And ultimately, what is the mortality and long-term outcome and the long-term side effects? So we're going to look at a, my own experience in what I would call a moderate volume, non-selective tertiary pediatric neurosurgery center. That is, these are patients who are coming primarily from within the catchment area in New York. That would be New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. They're not traveling far distances. 
We see about, we saw about 45,000 outpatient visits over the last 15 years. All the patients we see come with insurance and about a third of them have Medicaid or managed care Medicaid. So we're not a fee for service operation. So this is a very unselected population. And out of this group, we had about 600 patients who on, di on discharge had a diagnosis of Chiari malformation. Now, this probably underestimates the number of people who came complaining of Chiari, because many of them were reclassified as headaches. But at least 1.5% of our overall outpatient volume seems to be people who come to us with a concern about a Chiari. Out of those 600 plus patients, about 100 patients ultimately were considered surgical candidates based on the criteria we talked about earlier. We followed them for, sorry about that. That's the problem with giving talks when you're close to your home institution. Uh, so we followed them for at least two years with an average follow-up of nearly four years. The average patient was a 10-year-old, um, slight female predominance. We found that genetic syndromes were present in about 8% of this unselected population. And in fact, Ehlers-Danlos, which is a problem that seems to be more prevalent in the adult population, is relatively rare in the general Chiari uh, population. Other conditions, which are craniofacial conditions, cruzones, are well known to be associated with Chiari, as well as achondroplasia or dwarfism. About half the patients had headaches as part of their presentation, but only about 15% of them had the classic headaches that we would associate unequivocally with the Chiari malformation. Those patients who cough, sneeze, laugh too much, strain to have a bowel movement, and have the sudden severe headache in the back of the head, usually lasting for a relatively short time. By the same token, very few patients had true neurologic deficits. And a relatively large number of patients had the Chiari and, in fact, the syrinx diagnosed for other reasons. Here's an example of a ch the same child we talked about earlier who came to us having had an accident while playing soccer, had a head injury, had a Chiari seen on a CT and an MRI scan, and then we went ahead and we ensured that they did not have a syrinx telling the family that probably you don't, but in fact, they did. We've used a uniform surgical technique. I'm one of those guys who opens the door in virtually everybody. Um, we like to preserve for the surgeons, we like to keep the muscle and fascia attached to the superior nuchal line so that we can get a true watertight closure at the end. We make a relatively small incision, about seven centimeters, we take uh, advantage of the Sagita retractor system to pull the skin down to give us our inferior exposure. Um, the, over, the average size of our opening of the skull is about four by two centimeters, slightly scaled up and scaled down for the age of the patient. As Dr. Menezes demonstrated earlier, we do open the door in all the patients, and in a fair number, we do see significant scarring particularly over the cerebellar tonsils, and quite often we see an arachnoid veil or a web of thickened arachnoid blocking the outlet of the fourth ventricle, the foramen omegendi. We will coagulate the tonsils, but not frequently. Um, and we do use a dural sealant um, in most of the patients. We like to use this modified duroplasty this is where I get to say, this is what I do better than everyone else, and everyone else then will then disagree with me. Um, where we sort of tee the uh, dura as we open it at the bottom end, so that when it closes, we don't have any points down here where you can have secondary constriction. Um, this is not anything novel. It was described well over 10 years ago, and it's been in practice in many institutions. So what were our results? We had no uh, death and no long-term death in this entire group of patients, of about 100 patients. We had no permanent new complications, no neurologic deficits. We did not have a single wound healing problem. We did not have any CSF leakage. We did not have any surgical pseudomeningocele, no hemorrhage, and our average stay was three days. <coughs> 
In general, children under 10 stayed one to two days. Children over 10 stayed two to four days. Complications? We had one infection in the group, which I blame on the state of New Jersey. I had a teenager who was actually a neighbor of mine who seven days after surgery, as teenagers are willing to do, ignored my advice and went swimming off the Jersey Shore. I, to this day, believe his serratia meningitis is related to that episode. We did have three patients in the group who had a significant aseptic meningitis or chemical reaction that did resolve, but it did last for several weeks and required prolonged course of steroids. We did not find any impact of dural sealants, although other centers have found that to be a problem. In terms of syringomyelia, which is easily the most objective thing to follow and see, we found that with dural opening, um, at last follow-up, over 95% of our patients had had an improvement. About 87% improved with one operation, with two-thirds having dramatic collapse of the syrinx within three months of surgery. Um, over 80% had dramatic collapse by six months. The, th um, the seven patients who recurred, recurred an average of three years later. I remember one of the first articles I reviewed when I was becoming interested in um, Chiari and syrinx was an article out of Dr. Menezes' group with, I believe, Dr. Estes, if I remember back correctly, who showed that you have to follow your patients for at least four years to know if your surgery is successful or not. But as one can see in this graph, the complete resolution that has absolutely no syrinx at all is present in about two-thirds of the patients at the end of this uh, series, usually by two and a half years, and over 95% will have significant improvement in the overall size. A couple of examples. This was a young man who actually uh, was seen initially at another institution where he was told that any chance of opening the door would be met with grievous harm. Uh, so he had, an, this is his initial scan. This was 18 months where he continued to have increasing sensory loss, no change in the syrinx. He then saw us, we opened the dura. This is three months post-dural decompression. And here he is uh, two years later with virtually no syrinx. This is one of the failures that I had. This was a young boy who was four years old, presented with scoliosis and no neurologic deficit, fairly significant syrinx, which then decompressed, but then recurred again three years later, or two years later, and in fact, when we re-explored the patient, he had reformed bone over the duroplasty, so he had essentially a recurrent um, syrinx. We've also seen this in kids on growth hormone, that they have a propensity to reform bone. Children are bone-making machines, so that can be a long-term issue. Headaches, which are a little bit more vague, not quite as crisp and clear as syrinx, nonetheless improved in our patients. Every patient who had a classic Chiari headache, the Valsalva-related, the Tussive headaches, improved by nine months, with over half the patients improving within 48 hours that is having no headache, again, after 48 hours from surgery, 83% to three months. All those patients who had non tussive headaches plus the tussive headaches um, improved, but they were all on migraine medication. We did have two patients recur, one from regrowth of bone, also a young child, and the other who did have a retroflex dodontoid, an anterior compression, who ultimately was our only patient who required anterior decompression infusion. So what did we learn from this small group of patients in a random selection, non-selected group? Well, we learned that you can do duroplasty if you use a standard technique and a standard operating team with no risk of CSF leak, no increased bleeding, no pseudomeningocele requiring operation, no hydrocephalus, and no extensive stay in hospital. There's a small risk of prolonged aseptic meningitis, and hopefully next to zero risk of infection if you don't go swimming off the Jersey Shore. Classic Chiari headaches are always relieved. Over 80% will have rapid improvements in syrinx within six months. 
and the likelihood of needing more extensive fusion or anterior decompression in the broad group of Chiaris probably remains about 1% or less. What leads to successful surgery? Well, I think that you need to appropriately select. You have to be careful of your indications, have realistic expectations with your patients, and understand that often, particularly with the headache patients, the surgery alone will not be the answer. That if you have mixed headaches, you can take care of one component with the surgery, but you may require additional medical management for the other component. As long as you can do an operation with minimal risk, I believe it is still worthwhile to treat pre-symptomatic or incidentally discovered syringomyelia, provided there is significant extension of the syrinx or expansion of the spinal cord. There is no good long-term natural history data in the MRI era about what happens to people with incidentally discovered syrinxes who are just followed. The only long-term information we actually have is from before MRI from Scandinavia, where they looked at a series of patients, all adults, all who had neurologic deficits at presentation, who did not have any treatment. Roughly one-third stayed stable, one-third got worse, and one-third had slight improvement without any treatment. But again, these were all patients who presented with neurologic deficits. I still believe that in the majority of children with a significant syrinx, if you get them in the pre-symptomatic stage and you do an operation that does not increase the risk to them, the likelihood is you're doing a prophylactic operation that is a benefit. And I think whatever technique you choose, we've chosen one with duroplasty. I don't think it's the only way of doing it. You want to be consistent. Being haphazard in your surgical technique or very much swinging from one side to the other as the winds blow, I tend to think courts disaster. Now I said at the start, first do no harm. But I think there are still a lot of answers that we don't have. There's no question that some of the patients that I've opened the dura on probably would have done just as well without duraplasty. I just don't know how to select those. I do know that with duraplasty, our results are as good or better than anyone else can describe. So at least for the time being, until someone comes up with objective criteria, we're going to continue to work this way. I don't know which patients with minimal symptoms and syringomyelia will remain stable indefinitely. I too remain hopeful that future radiographic studies may indicate with better reliability who we can watch and who we should uh, treat early. With 1% of the population having a Chiari, I don't know how many of these patients in the future will become symptomatic. Of all the adults who have symptomatic Chiaris and have undergone treatment, most of you had the Chiari as a, in childhood. We can't pick you out from the vast, vast majority who never progress. Leaves open the question, if you have an eight-year-old who's got a Chiari diagnosed after being in a motor vehicle accident, do you have to re-image them? How often do you have to re-image them? How often do you have to follow them? I don't know that answer. And ultimately, which patients with atypical presentations should be operated on where they may not follow the rules? Are the criteria that we have used for selection for surgery too strict? Probably because we have not had that many failures, so I suspect we're missing some patients who would benefit. And what adjuvant tests, what radiographic studies, sonographic studies, flow studies will ultimately prove to be beneficial? Right now, none of these tests carry the specificity and sensitivity of 95%, which I believe is necessary. So again, first do no harm. And thank you for your attention. And I want to thank uh, our research program and Teresa Hidalgo, my partner, who heads our research group, for putting some of the statistics together. Thank you very much.